the twofold prophecy is not more than that. I believe it's more than that. Uh, so he's he's a uh, uh, he's eventually going to be revealed. He's going to commit the abomination of desolation. His, the, the impetus, the force behind what makes him do this was already moving 2,000 years ago. Okay? And what is it? It's falsification. It's corruption of the truth. It's a twisting of the words of Elohim. It's a, it's a hiding of the truth from the common man. It's a, it's a resting away from people the knowledge of Elohim. Do you agree with that? Can you see what I'm talking about? Second Thessalonians chapter. And only that which now two, hinders will be taken from the midst. And that's what I believe supports the verse up top. Because something that is in his way, something that right now, this is you know, this is Shaul talking two thousand years ago, and he said, There is something on earth right now that is hindering this force. And it's not until that hindrance is taken out of the way that he can do all of this. Us still being here, right? That's that's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. We are the we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Those who follow Messiah and keep his Torah, those who trust in him, they have the testimony of Yeshua and keep his Torah. We are what preserves the earth. We are what stays the hand of judgment of Elohim. We are on this earth, so he is not going to destroy the earth while we are here. He didn't do it in Noah's day. He didn't do it to Jericho uh, when Rahab was there. He didn't do it to Sodom until he got Lot out. He didn't do it, you know, uh, to Jerusalem until he got the elite and the believers and the faithful of Jerusalem out. So Yahweh is in the business of getting his people out so that he can judge. Okay? So then what happens to the Holy Spirit? Is that, does the Holy Spirit leave also or... Well, by nature of what the Holy Spirit is, what is it? Well, it's the breath. It's, it's His breath. It's His presence. Um, when you're when you're God Almighty, you kind of just you know you're everywhere. Okay, and I know what other people teach: the Holy Spirit is going to be gone. Okay, uh, I disagree with that. I used to agree with it. I no longer agree with it because I've seen that Elohim's ruach is always operating in the world. Always. He's well, always up to and, something. And, if, and, if. and, and I'm going to say, let me say this. What a lot of people label as the Holy Spirit is not the Holy Spirit. It's just not. There's a lot of false, uh, you got to remember what we're talking about here. The false Mashiach. What is that? I've told you this. We talked about it a little bit last week. What is that? What is Mashiach? Anointing. Anointing. What do you think? What do you think? You know, people who are going around saying that they have the Holy Spirit, but breaking the Torah, and not only that, but teaching people that they must break the Torah. Do you think they're led by the Holy Spirit? They cannot be. They cannot be. They cannot be. Because Yahweh is not. Schizophrenic. He's not duplicitous about his word. So there are a lot of people who have an anointing. I'll give them that. But it ain't God's. Because they're, con they're, they're contradicting his very word. And it's the, it's the word of Elohim that is, that is the, the proof that you have the rule of Kodesh. Is that you agree with his word. His word agrees with you. Your actions agree with his word. His word governs your actions. Okay. And not to say that everybody who is keeping Torah is perfect. But to say that they are striving to do what is in the word. And that paramount above everything else. Okay. And that's, that's over every man's doctrine. And that, you know, that's what this congregation is about. Is finding out what is, what is his doctrine and what is man's doctrine. Okay, and Hasatan is very good about confusion, and that's what Babel is. Okay, and he is the man of confusion. He is the author. This guy is the, you know, he's basically the son of Satan, if you will. He's Satan manifested in a human body, is what he is. You know, it, it happened once before. Anybody know? Judas. 
clearly says, Hasatan entered him. Comes out and says it. And then he betrayed Messiah. Okay? So, uh, that's what's going to happen to this guy. But he's going to be a willful, a willing vessel for Hasatan. Okay? And he's going to want Hasatan to win the war. And he's going, he knows what he's doing. He's deceiving people in the, into believing that he is the Messiah of <laughs> any religion. Of every religion. That includes Baptists, Pentecostal, Catholics, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims. He's everybody's Messiah. Okay? Now let's get to the verse that I was looking for. I hope I find it. Uh, then at length will that evil one be revealed. Then, at, So what is the then? After whatever force is hindering him is taken out of the way, whatever force is removed from him out of his way, then he will be revealed. Okay? Uh, whom our master Yeshua will consume by the breath of his mouth and will bring to nothing by the visibility of his coming. So when Messiah comes back, he's going to destroy the man of perdition. Satan himself is not destroyed at that point, but the person who embodied Hasatan or allowed Hasatan to embody him, that man will be destroyed just like that, along with a, probably a billion other people, if not more. Okay? For the coming of the evil one is the working of Hasatan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all the deceptiveness of iniquity in them that perish. Because they did not receive the love of the truth by which they might have life. Therefore, now watch, I want you to understand this. To not receive it means you have to have heard it. Right? So they have heard the truth. They've been told the truth, but they didn't receive it. Therefore, Elohim will send upon them the strength of a deception that they may believe the lie. And that they may be condemned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in iniquity. Now this is where, this kind of goes to your question. Remind me of your name? I've forgotten. Leticia. Leticia. This is where it gets very dangerous for people who are still running in Christian circles. Okay? And again, we don't condemn Christians. That's not what we're here for. Uh, we want them to wake up to the fullness of the truth. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. But they have pleasure in iniquity. So we must define what iniquity is. And most of the time when Christians read this, they're thinking about the queers and the drunks and the drug addicts. That's not what iniquity is. It's breaking the Torah. Transgressing the Torah. Breaking the Torah. Going against the Torah. And Yeshua was teaching to a Pharisee when he said, they do not come into the truth. And what is the truth in a first century Jewish mind? The Torah. Because they love their evil deeds. That's, that's linked to this word here, iniquity. Okay? Let me ask you this. Is breaking the Sabbath a sin? Yes. Does that then make it iniquity? No, not in and of itself one time. Well, not one time. What is iniquity? Okay. We're going to split hairs. I can split hairs with the best of them. <laughs> to hear, remember what we said. They've heard the truth and they've rejected it. To hear and know that there is a particular issue about which God is fond, and to not respond to it, that is iniquity. Do you agree? Yes. Yes. Are you pointing at something, or are you asking a question? I'm pointing at you. Okay. I, 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 because of the different verbiage that you sin, trespasses, iniquity, I always consider inequity, at least in my heart, as my willful disobedience. In other words, I knew it was a violation of Torah, and I deliberately disobeyed it anyway. So it willful is. Willful disobedience. Could we yeah, continue that thought? Because I know you've heard that in the seminary. We've all been taught. There's 
sin, there's iniquity. It's iniquity is continued sin. That's been ingrained in us, even in the Christian ease. Using that term loosely, not with evil thought. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> close, not close? Very close. Yeah. Well, there's different types of uncleanness, too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> Tame, Jaquettes, and Taliba, Big Wool. Yeah, that's abomination. Mm -hmm. But what's the difference between iniquity, Amen, and Pesha? Like crime or sin? Well, it's kind of like what Steve is talking about. And it's been a while since I did the study on these particular words. I've done that study, but basically one of them is, I slipped. The other one is, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that the avon is the, what, like Steve pointed out, that's what's being interpreted as iniquity. And that is the one that is just, I don't right. care. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. It, or, you know, justifying it. It's okay. Okay, whereas the other one is, like all of us, like he pointed out, we've broken the Sabbath. I've been a Sabbath keeper for some, you know, going on 20 years. And sure, I've broken it, but not intentionally. You know, I've never kept it perfect, but because I am making that effort, Messiah perfects it for me every week. You understand that? Okay, we probably need to talk about that again because we have new people in here. But we get our perfection from Him. Okay, and man, I know you had a statement or a question I'll get to. Our perfection comes from Him, but our perfection is given to us when we're making an effort to be perfect. Okay? He meets us, he, he fills up the gap. And I used to, I gotta get to Matt before I, I get to you again, Steve. I used to draw this picture to try to explain this concept, and I'm gonna do it again tonight because there's new folks in the room, but you need to understand this. None of us are perfect and none of us ever will be, right? Okay, so how is it that we obtain perfection when Messiah tells us to be perfect? How is it that we can deal with our transgressions on a daily or weekly basis or a momentary basis? Uh, because we know that when we have sinned and we know we've sinned and the Ruach is dealing with us, that we are not in His presence. Okay? And that goes to what you're talking about, Sharon. Yes, there is a, a, a sensation uh, uh, sort of a, an anomaly about those last seven years where they won't have the power to live the life. You know, their proof of their faith during that seven years is that they choose to die for the Messiah. Okay? So, in my opinion, you kind of have to have the ruch to do that. I don't think you can do it without. I don't think you can either. Okay? So let me let me draw this diagram, then I'm gonna to get to Matt. You can put your arm down, I'll try to remember it. Drive the marker out while I'm standing there talking. <laughs> okay, so and this this diagram is on the website, by the way. Uh, so here we all are. Every human being in the world is a fallen person, right? right? And when we come to Messiah, all of a sudden, you are made clean enough for the rule of the Kodesh to dwell inside of you, right? right. And, and if you have believed fully and understood more fully, then you are, you are even clean enough and, and Elohim decides to put the fullness of His Ruach around you and on you, to use you, to work through you and do powerful things uh, for his kingdom, right? So what happened to your sin? That doesn't tell me what happened to my sin. It was covered. It was covered. Okay? But did I become perfect? No. Absolutely not. So how is it that I warrant receiving the perfect gift of the rule of the Kodesh? Because of Messiah's perfection. It's, it says that He imparted righteousness to us. He gave 
justification to us as a free gift. And that is what I'm trying to draw up here. Okay? And that's not salvation, by the way. Okay? <laughs> so, here we are when we're a believer. A brand new... We, we come to faith. Now, all of a sudden... This huge gap between perfect imperfection, which is that bottom horizontal line, and that top line is the perfection of Messiah. And so that, that vertical line is the gap that's between unrighteousness and perfection. Right? And as soon as you believe in Messiah, you are justified fully. Isn't that what the Word says? Okay. But you're not perfected because you're told... Press on toward the mark of the high calling of God in Messiah Yeshua. I am not perfected yet, but I press on every day, as what Shoal said. That's the other side. So after years and years and years and years of struggling, we might get that far in our life. Right? But we still have the other side. So this is... What perspective is that on the right side and what perspective is it on the left side? It's the perspective of Elohim, the Father, on the right side. He sees what Messiah did for you. And so you're welcomed into His presence. So you, you walk in there basically shrouded in Messiah and your sins are covered. So that's all He sees is the perfection of Messiah. The world is on this side. They're looking at us and they go, you ain't so perfect. I'm like, bingo. But you should see how my dad sees me. Right? Okay. And so, it, but it's our goal to show a better image. Wouldn't it be nice if all of us got about 90% or 98%, you know, and could get closer to Messiah to show the world what walking in faith is. And we, and we will never do it as individuals. But the world will see what Elohim sees when we become one. When a group of people become a chad, then all of a sudden, because they know how difficult it is to be people. <laughs> right? Yeah. Matt, what'd you have? Well, it's just uh, contrasting sin to iniquity. Uh, sins are individual actions that are just contrary to the Elohim's will. Right. We know this. Iniquity to me, from what I try to understand, is something that can be built. When a person says, I am going to do such and such, even though it's contrary to what will be, that comes from a well of, of iniquity. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's something that's built up in a life, father to son, generation to generation, and it becomes stronger and stronger. And like your vertical line is representing, it's really the iniquity. That, that's right. That, Yeshua came to save us, this people, from their sins. He didn't say anything. That's right. Words. You have to walk this. It's, down. Yeah, and, and if you read the book of Hebrews carefully, and I've talked this before, there is no sacrifice for rebellion. Mm -hmm. Messiah did not die for rebellion, which is what iniquity is. That's what Matt's talking about. It's a willful desire to do one's own will over the will of the living. It's got a history. It's, it comes from the source. Yeah. Isn't iniquity passed down to the third and fourth generation? Sin is chatat. Mm -hmm. If you look at the text, it says that the, the sins, the chatat of the fathers, is passed down to the third and fourth generation. Those are specific infractions against the Torah. The biggest one I can think of is alcoholism. I believe that that is a sin that is easily passed down to the next kid. You can see it. Um, you don't even have to know your biological father and you will inherit traits. You know, you can grow up without your... My daughter grew up without her biological father in the house, but she commits some of these same sins that he does. Okay? So it's sins that, it, that gets passed down, but iniquity is a state of the heart that is built over a period of just continuing to sin. Knowing that you're sinning. Knowing that it's wrong, continuing to do it, and not changing. And sadly enough, there's a lot of believers like that because I'm telling you, 
Preachers know when the Sabbath is. They know. That's iniquity. To know when the Sabbath is, and yet not only not to observe it yourself, but to teach others to break it. That does not necessarily mean that they're wrong, although it could, that they're unsaved, although it could mean that. It could mean that, they're, that they are innocent in it and they haven't awakened to the fact that they themselves have been misled. But it also could be that they just don't care. Okay? It's inconvenient to change it to the Sabbath. It's inconvenient. It's, 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 it's well, you know, are. It would threaten their paycheck. It would threaten their livelihood. It would threaten a lot of, you know, the status quo. So... Um, but there is no sacrifice for intentional, continuous, rebellious sin. Messiah didn't come to die for that. That's iniquity. And that's why uh, this is the man of iniquity, the son of perdition. Okay? And they will be condemned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in iniquity. And this is what I'm talking about. It's not only just people who say they believe in God and commit sexual sin. That's iniquity, yes. But it's also people who say they believe in God and don't obey a Sabbath, don't keep His feasts, don't treat people the way they should treat people, and all those other laws that apply to people that are not observed. Okay? That's iniquity. Because we know better. Right? We know better than to run our mouths about people. Especially in this congregation. You know, it comes up at least once a year. We'll show them what Rod does. The evil tongue. Yet we do it. And we take pleasure in it. Whoa. And I know there's people who slip into it. It's easy to slip into when someone gets to run in their mouth, isn't it? You can just jump right in there and run just like a motorboat right next to them. That's not what we're talking about, but continuing to just persist and persist and persist. Knowing that it's wrong. I'm going to do it anyway because I take pleasure in this. It's my joy to bring that person down. That's iniquity too. So there's all kinds of things that fall into this category that we're supposed to be examining ourselves about. Okay? Um, so that's what I wanted to point out. And that is what is embodied in this person who is the Sheker HaMashiach. Because he's the one telling the world, you ain't got to worry about that. Don't worry about it. And he's going to stand up and say, I'm God. I'll tell you whether or not you're going to heaven. You know? And it doesn't matter what you do on this earth. You fall down and worship me, you'll be okay. And that's what, you know, what's going on in this world right now is conditioning the human mind to receive him. That's what's going on. Political correctness. It's, it's all preparing human beings to receive the lying Messiah. And so people who are in Christian circles, and I, the reason I pick on them is because we live in a, a country that claims to be 85 to 90% Christian. And so that's what I know. I mean, uh, I've been to Europe, and I know that in Europe, they have a legacy of Christianity, but they don't even claim that anymore. By and large, a lot of them are pagans. Most of them are agnostic. Um, they're going they've, in England. They've gone back to Druidism, <laughs> going back to their roots. Uh, but where was I going? So yeah. So here, uh, the conditioning of the mind to say that you know, oh well. Jesus loves all of us, and it, you know, it really doesn't matter as long as we believe in Jesus. That's one of the biggest lies there is. As much as I love Messiah, that's one of the biggest lies there is. Because that makes that, that tells people you can break Torah, you don't have to worry about Torah, you're okay. Okay? And that's not what Yeshua taught us. As a matter of fact, Yeshua said, Whoever teaches the least of my children to break the commandments. It's better that he have a millstone tied around his neck and be cast into the sea. And that's what we talked about last week in Revelation 18, I believe it is. That the that Bavel has a millstone thrown at her. Right? 
and in the sea, right? Doesn't she sit on many waters? I believe that Yeshua, when he said that, was hinting about Babel. I believe that's a remez about Babel. Because it's one of the only places that the millstone is used in the whole scripture. Itself, not alone. Wickedness and favorable situation from the Latin iniquitatum, nominative and iniquitous, from unequalness, unevenness, injustice, down to quality, from iniquitous, injustice, unequal. Uh, basically, the whole idea of not being equal to the level. I thought that was hilarious because here's the thing man was built in the likeness of the machine. Man does not like to work out of the way or way he matters. What the machine is the way of balancing the scales. In the way of the, of the Torah, the laws of weights and measures, don't use unequal weight, he's using the blood to work within the corpus of his own law to work out the corpus of his law. And the more we sin, well, that's why grace is much more balanced. Uh, because it, the more that, it, it's the more that the he has to use the weights of redemption of the blood to balance the weight of the scales of injustice to keep us equal to the corpus of the law and make us able to be righteous. This is also why we're encouraged to press on so that the weights of measure are used less because we're built in his likeness and I'll just let that for a long. But then using the millstone, I think, is the other side of that, which is what makes it such a grand idea because he's using the weights to take down the negative and equal the positive. He's using it on both sides. Well, like yeah. Out the positive and negative on, itself. on each side of the scale, on this side, you have... Uh, head or grace, and on this side you have judgment. Okay, and the millstone is exactly. You ain't got no grace. Okay. So, so it's so, like this. Remember that helical thing we were talking about? Mm -hmm. It's like this is different levels of the he he helix idea sure. with even the weights and measures idea on different levels. I mean, it's it's wonderfully hilarious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so. Chapter 18, I believe, is where we left off, right? In Revelation. In Revelation, chapter 18. <coughs> I think we made it a few verses into the chapter. Does anybody remember? Let's just start at the beginning. After these things, I saw another messenger come down from heaven. And he had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his glory. And he cried with a strong voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Bavel Hagadol, and has become a cavern of demons, and the home of every unclean spirit, and the home of every unclean and hateful bird, and the home of every unclean and hateful beast of prey. All the nations have drunken of the wine of her wrath, and the kings of the earth have practiced harlotry or hoarded with her. And the merchants of the earth have been enriched by the abundance of her luxuries. So if we are talking about, if, if it's possible that man-made religion mixed with some of the truth of God in it is Babel, has man profited off of that? Yes. Yeah, for 1,700 years and more. They were already doing those things. They were already preaching for money in Paul's day. Did you know that? Shaul said, even though they're preaching for money, let them preach. Because in spite of their motives, the word of God is preached. So he, he is saying, allow it to go on, and at the end, Elohim will take care of it, basically. And I believe that's where we are. Okay, is we're at the end, and, you know, God has had his fill with it. See, he looks at the human race as a single entity. Right? So this is why during the season of Teshuvah, when we are repenting, we're not just repenting for ourselves, but we're repenting for the sins of our fathers because of the transmission of sin from one generation to the next, but also because mankind is going to be judged at the end. Okay? And so it, it, because it's a generational thing, what generation, every generation had the opportunity to turn it over. To turn it around. To shuv. 
to repent and to change it. And by and large, they never did. Pockets of generations have occasionally risen up and tried to keep the Torah of Elohim and tried to be righteous. That has gone on perpetually. But mankind wholesale has never done that. Right? You know, in, after the Civil War, there was a great awakening. And, and uh, after the Revolution, there was a great awakening. There was a religious fervor in the United States. And a lot of people came to faith, and that's where a lot of denominations came from. It didn't exist before about 160 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> so when a Catholic tells you, well, you came out of us, he's right. <laughs> Uh, what verse were we in? Three. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins and may not partake of her plagues. For her sins have reached up to heaven, and Elohim has remembered her iniquities. Recompense you to her as she also has recompensed, and rendered to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mixed to her twofold. As much as she pleased herself with lusting, so much of anguish and sorrow give to her, because she says in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow, and I will see no sorrow. Therefore, in one day, Will these her plagues come, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned with fire, for strong is Master Yahweh Elohim who judges her. And the kings of the earth who committed whoredom with her, whoredom and were lustful with her, will weep and mourn and bewail her when they will see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off from fear of her torment, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babel, the powerful city, for in one hour your judgment is come. Merchants of the earth will mourn over her because no one purchases her cargo. No more the cargo of gold. We read all of this last week. Didn't we? Okay. And the fruits, verse 14, and the fruits which your soul desired have departed from you, and all things delicious and splendid have perished from you, and the traders in them will obtain them no more. And they who were enriched from her will stand afar off. For the fear of her torment, and will weep and mourn, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, which was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and gilded with gold, precious stones and pearls, because in one hour such riches are laid waste. Uh, and just saw the smoke of the burning saying, Lord, there's a great city. So it repeats it again and says, In one hour her, her, uh, she has become desolate. Rejoice, O heaven, and you messengers and shlichim and prophets, because Elohim judges your cause with her. And a messenger took up a stump. So, so let's talk about that. Rejoice over her, O heaven and earth, messengers, apostles, that's what shlichim is, and prophets, because Elohim judges your cause with her. Now let me ask you this. What has the United States ever done to the prophets? That's huh? P-R-O-F-I-T or P-R-O-F-I-T? P-H-E-T. We threw them out. The United States didn't do anything with the first year they had to the prophets, but like That's my point. A lot of people are saying that the United States is Babylon. I disagree. We're not talking about a geographic place here. We're not talking about a literal explosion and destruction. We're talking about a perpetual forgetfulness about religion that cheated on Elohim. The mixture of man's religion with God's truth. That's what hard ultra is. It's mixing... The, the lies of Hasatan with the truth of Elohim. That's what Israel was guilty of. And so Israel came out of Babylon at one time. You remember that? Israel was taken into Babylon as captives. And they 
wailed and mourned over it and said, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept over Zion. And when we go home, that's kind of where we are, right? So, if, and, and here's the big puzzle that everybody, and a lot of people in Messianic circles are trying to figure it out, and Christianity, some Christians are trying to figure it out, because some Christians do read their uh, Greek eyes by the light. Um, but they do read it, and they see this, and they go, well, where is Babylon? How do we get out of it? Okay, and they think it's a geographic place. And I used to be one of those, I confess. Um, I don't believe that's what it is. Well, if you go by that, your question of what has the United States done to Babylon, it's more what has the, or the prophets, what has the church done to the prophets? You could look at it that way. I mean, you could look at it that way. The church way. itself has kicked out the prophets saying that they're heretics. Okay, but, okay, but if but you look at this, happen. they are alive in heaven at this time. And they are looking at Elohim and they're wondering, when is our recompense going to be taken out on this planet? Okay. Right. And, and the reason that I disagree is because Babel is embodied by this husband of hers, this man of perdition as well. And he basically turns on her. He uses religion for a season. It's time to count the omer. Uh, well, it's almost time. Uh, he uses Babel for a season and then he basically ransacks her and gets rid of her. And, 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 you know. and so this destruction that comes from Elohim is actually being performed through the man of perdition. Are you with me on that? So the millstone is the Torah. Would you think? How do we how do we talk about law when we're talking about the law of the land and people being punished? I'm gonna throw the book at you. You're gonna, you're gonna feel the whole weight of the law. Two-thirds of the population die. You know, I see my point of sight to go through that hand of, yeah, he's going to use the man by his side and use this system to prop himself up and then he's going to kill it. That's right. And like you were saying earlier about conditioning, we had hero worship going on now. We worship pitchers, quarterbacks, politicians. We're being conditioned. Rappers. I mean, you name it. And, 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 this country, and I believe the whole world, because it, you know the traveling that I did in Europe and over in the Middle East, it's the same thing. People are being conditioned for the mark. Oh, Tattoos are vogue. Yeah. Taking a mark in your body is no big deal anymore. Mm -hmm. I can remember when I was a kid, if you got a tattoo, you were dirty, you were skank, you were right. nasty, right. you were druggish. Yeah. Or in the Navy. Or in the Navy. <laughs> You can feel free to examine my body. I was in the Navy, but I did not get a tattoo. Look at North Korea now. They started their revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's always a perpetual revolution like Castro. There's no one there's no one that they're against, but they had that revolution keep on going. Yep. And now that that religion of communism is served its purposes, what do they do now? They worship the leader of North Korea. That's right. That's right. And that's, that's just a little microcosm of what we're seeing. That's, that's a little tiny picture, a representation of what's going to happen to the whole world. And, and uh, it's already happened to this country. You know? Uh, so. Do you know where it said it as far as this, if there's destruction in the city? You know, don't you think it's 
you know, it, it's like God saying it's him who does it. It's in the prophets. I can't remember. Uh, what is, is it Habakkuk? We talked about that last night. I think it might be in Habakkuk. Um, it's like, it's like, it's, our, it's, it's a wake-up call. It's like all this stuff that's been happening in the United States, there's so many people professing to be believers. It's, it's, you know, my sister, when they had all the hurricanes going through the Bible Belt, she's like, but he's hitting the wrong spot. And I said, no, he's not. I said, who do you think he's trying to wake he up? He disciplines his children first. Right. Yeah. I said, right. And, and that's what I told her. I said, he's hitting just the right spot because who's he trying to wake up? Who's he trying to, you know? And they keep te pre preaching and teaching, oh, everything will be good for you. Like everything's, but it's not. I had a dream last night. And all I remember is waking up this morning. The thought that was on my mind was I was telling the person, no, you don't understand. It's got to get a lot worse. It's going to, for us, it's going to be a lot worse before, he, you know, before he gets here. It has to be. It has to be. It, well, yeah. Um, I mean, this was my dream. I was like, it woke me up. Well, you know, not to belittle what you're saying at all, but you would have to be kind of slow not to see that it's about to get worse. <laughs> I mean, yes. if you know anything about economics, then you know, because that's the main idol in this country. Covetousness is an idol. Is an idol. Yes. Money is idolatry. And that's the chief idol in this country. And goes right, why are people worshiping quarterbacks? Because they're paid millions of dollars. Why do they become quarterbacks? Because they're paid millions of dollars. Uh, it's all about kesef, money. And it's, it's not, and, and it was that way in Israel. Israel was wealthy before Jeremiah came. And Israel was guilty of stealing property from widows who, who were supposed to maintain their own land. And then they would come and move their boundary stones. Read in the prophets. It wasn't just idolatry of bowing down to, to this, even though that was part of what Israel was in. There were other forms of idolatry, the, caste, the, the greed that caused people to steal people's land. Innocent people who couldn't protect themselves just go in and take their land. Land was money back then. Okay? Uh, and so you look at this country and what's the primary motivator when people go to vote? How's it going to affect my check? For those who are on the Republican side, they don't want more taxes taken out. For those who are on the Democrat side, they want to be given more from the government. Okay? But both are guilty about worshiping the money. Because that's how they're casting their vote. It's based on what the government is going to do with their money. You're going to take it from me. You're not going to give it to me. That's the two sides. That's basic. That's politics of one one, really. And uh, so things are going to get worse in this country. And financially, you better prepare for it. <laughs> because it's not going to be long. And economically, we cannot sustain what we're in right now. $80 billion of new fake money every month. And what is that doing? It's turning the dollar into a piece of paper. Less than that. Yeah, because that's all it is now. Yeah. <laughs> Less than that. It's called fiat currency. It's going to be, it's going to, you know, it's going to cost $15 for a gallon of milk. $30 for a gallon of gasoline. I mean, it's going to get ridiculous. And the, and the suffering starts, and we are going to participate in that. The body is not going to escape from that. It didn't escape from it 100 years ago when the first depression hit. Okay, there's been other depressions in this country that just weren't as long. That one was called the Great Depression because it lasted longer and it was harder to recover from. I don't know, this one's going to be the super mega depression because I don't think this country will ever get out of it. And the damage is going to be worse. Back then, they were farming communities, and they could still they could still eat. Okay. But I I tell you, I think that it's going to be amazing watching how Yahweh takes care of his his people when we trust in him. That's right. That's right. But who always gets blamed when they don't get sick? No, the black plague. Who got blamed? The Jews, because they were keeping. They were keeping proper law. 
So who's going to get blamed when people are dying from the bird flu, which they're saying is going to be even worse now, this new strain they have, and all this other stuff? If we're keeping proper, we're going to be okay, and who are they going to blame? They got to be able to <laughs> Okay. What you got? Well, this is just something I noticed. It's one of those moments. I'm at... If all of y'all know this, and I'm just the first, I'm just now coming in on this, and just, you know, nod and move on without me. But when it starts in verse 12, and the listing of all those items, mm -hmm. it just occurred to me, those are all items that were originally used to build the tabernacle and to perform the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Is there, if, I mean, is, is there like a spiritual... Well, that, that's what that's what proves that what we're talking about here is religion. Okay, that's what proves that what we're talking about here is a woman who thinks she is God's bride, but is not. She's a harlot. She's dressed thinking she's the bride of Elohim, but she is not because she's doing things that He has instructed her not to do, and so she possesses all the things of the tabernacle on a spiritual sense. In other words, you have the word, you have the ability to see how to worship me, but you're not doing it. Okay? And so that's why Elohim says in verse 4, come out of her, not come out of it. Okay? Or there, you know, T-H-E-R-E. -E. He didn't say come out of there geographically, come out of that country. He said come out of her. And so that, that kind of solidifies, and those verses right there talking about all of this stuff that is, that's... That's what was in the that was what was in the Beit Hamikdash, basically. And everything they needed for the sacrifices as well—the mm -hmm. grain, the wine, the oil, mm -hmm. the, All the sheep. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? See. Oh, earlier. Yeah. Um, um, well, let's go to John 3. Yochanan Shalosh. And there was a certain man of the Pharisees whose name was Nicodemus, a ruler of the Odeans. This man came to Yeshua at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you were sent from Elohim. For a man teacher is not able to do these miracles that you do, except he who Elohim is with. And Yeshua answered and said to him, Amen, Amen, I say to you, that if a man is not born from the beginning, he is not able to see the kingdom of Elohim. Okay. Nicodemus said to him, How is it possible to enter the womb of his mother the second time and be born? And Yeshua answered and said to him, Amen, amen, or truly, truly, I say to you, that if a man is not born from water and spirit, he is not able to enter the kingdom of Elohim. The thing which is born of flesh is flesh, and the thing which is born from spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I have said to you that it is necessary for you to be born from the beginning. The wind will blow where it desires, and you hear its voice, but you do not know from where it comes, where it goes. Likewise, is everyone who is born from spirit. How is it possible for these things to be? And Yeshua answered and said to him, You are the teacher of Israel, and these things you do not understand. I say to you that again, that the thing which we know we speak, we testify to the thing which we see, and our testimony you do not receive. I've explained earthly things to you. And you do not believe. How then will I explain heavenly things? And so man has ascended in, no man has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. The Son of Man is he who was in heaven. As Moshe is lifted up, the serp serpent in the wilderness, the Son of Man is about to be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have life that is eternal. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. So this is the big treatise on being born again.
okay? Um, and some people think that that's all you got to do is be born again. All right, but if a woman has a baby and leaves him in the street, what happens to him? He's covered by grace. No, he's not. He dies. <laughs> That's not my analogy. My analogy is we're talking about a baby, a human baby. If you leave it alone in a back alley by itself, it will die. It will either be eaten by a wolf or it will starve to death or it will get sick and die earlier than that. It will perish. Okay. And so when you are born, you have the ability. If, when you're born in Elohim from the beginning, the one who was from the beginning is Messiah. So it is being born in Messiah. It is having, it is having the life of Messiah, the same thing that transpired in the womb of Mary. The power that raised him from the dead lives inside of you and trans, transforms who you are and gives you the ability to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he's talking about earthly things. He's not talking about going to heaven. Isn't that what he just said? Yes. I'm talking to you about earthly things. And you can't understand it. What is he talking about? When you are born again, when you are born from the beginning, when you have the renewal of the word of Elohim planted inside of you, when you get back a deposit of what Adam had in the garden, then you can see the kingdom of Elohim. Then you can understand. You can, then you can read the word and understand what it is saying. Then you can uh, enter into the kingdom and do the works of the kingdom. Primarily keeping the Torah, but also doing the miracles that come with that. You know, you wonder why in the second century somebody had to write to Polycarp and ask, why are the miracles disappearing? I don't know what his answer was, but he could have said, well, because you ain't keeping the Torah. Because that's, that's when the congregations of Elohim started to not keep Torah. Justin Martyr was a second century believer who started worshiping on Sunday instead of Shabbat. Started not keeping Torah. And all of a sudden the miracles start disappearing. And we don't make a big deal of it here, but we've had miracles happen in our congregation. It's just, we're not about miracles. We're not trying to advertise. Come see our miracles. Sure, great. Right. <laughs> Two for one. Yeah, we're not selling them. It's, it's about tending to the body and having the, the needs of the body met. And so Elohim does do miracles in our congregation, right? How many of you know that? All right. So, uh, being born into the kingdom of Elohim means you've been given the opportunity to grow up as a son of Elohim. And just like anybody born in your house... And I came from a family of five. We all grew up in the same house. We all had the same parents. But one of my brothers rejected his parents and was disowned because of his, because of his rejection of the ways of the family. Okay? He had every opportunity to be one of us until they died. He chose to walk away from the family. How many of you have had family members do that? So has God. There's people that walk away from the family of Elohim. They've tasted. They've been born into his household. They've walked in his household. They've been given the opportunity. That's what John 1 says. To those who believed or trusted in him, he gave them power to become sons of Elohim. And that means to grow up. That means to be fully mature in the kingdom. So... They're born into his family. They, they, what does that mean? That means that the deposit of the rule of Hakodesh has been given them. We're not talking about the power of the rule of Hakodesh, the outward manifestation of it. We're talking about the indwelling power to what you're supposed to be. And here's the thing. That perfection that we talked about happens at that moment. 